At Believe, our mission is to develop recording artists and labels in the digital world. We believe that the best way to accomplish our mission is to provide them the solutions they need to grow their audience at each stage of their career. Streaming has changed how people discover music, paving the way for the rise of independent artists and labels. With digital, the new generations of millions of aspiring artists can now take their music to the world with TuneCore. In this decade, more artists than ever will find a path to make a living of their art freely and independently. Digital is changing the way artists are developed. Thousands of artists and labels are now using Belief's technology platform, innovative digital solutions, and relying on the expertise of our local teams in 50 countries. To our 1,500 believers, continue to learn and be inspired by the many artists whose careers you're contributing to elevate, and be proud of the labels you've helped develop in the past 15 years. To artists and labels, we thank you for trusting us with your creative life, with your digital business. Your independence, your power and your freedom is our strength. We believe in you. To our digital partners, your unwavering engagement by your side propels us forward. To our new shareholders, your investment will support the development of our talent, our technology platform and the acquisition of new capabilities. Together, let's shape a respectful, diverse, fair and transparent future for independent artists and labels. Thank you. So that was uh, Dennis from uh, Believe. He's going to be joining us tomorrow, I'm going to say tomorrow afternoon, uh, to, to chat um, with uh, the Spotify and TikTok speakers as well. So. Uh, don't forget to tune in for that. Welcome back. It's the final session of the first day of the Music Matters Academy, and we're doing Publishing Matters today, and this is Publishing Matters Part 3. We have a great, great session lined up for you, and helming that session is none other than our good friend Shahid. Uh, Shahid is from Believe. Um, we have met Shahid many, many times and worked with him many, many times. He's helmed many, many sessions live and online at Music Matters before. Um, but just by way of a quick introduction before I hand over to you, um, who are you and what, what do you do for, what do you do for Believe? That's the, thanks so much, Jasper, for having me. I'm, I'm really, really excited to be on this panel today. Um, so who, who am I? I'm currently the head of artist services at Believe, based here in Singapore, and I take care of the Southeast Asia and Australia, New Zealand regions for this part of the business. And, uh, you know, we've been working together, Jasper, for so many years. Uh, every year I come back to Music Matters, I, I, I come back in a slightly different role, whether it was management, whether it was, uh, uh, you know, uh, even you know, taking care of Singapore artists and that were playing on Music Matters Live. So I'm really happy to be here in this capacity. Nothing, to, I, I don't do anything with publishing today, and yet I'm really, really excited to be actually moderating this panel with some really amazing panelists. Over to you. Thank you so much, Jasper. So once again, welcome everyone to Music Matters Academy, part three of the Publishing Matters, organized and produced by the good folks of Branded, and of course, you know, pre uh, presented by YouTube Music and Belief. So it's our last session of today, and it's the first of eight modules in the series. And I've hoped you had the opportunity to view and participate in the earlier sessions, because I was, you know, going in and out, watching as many of those that were happen happening since this morning, for me at least, in here in Singapore. But if you haven't, don't worry, we have a time machine that will allow you to go back in time to view it all later. But here we are, the home stretch. So I'm, as I mentioned to Jasper early on, I'm really extremely excited that Branded planned the, to start the academy with a topic that is the foundation of everything that is our music industry. I really truly believe this. The composition and melody that becomes an earworm, the crafting of lyrics that becomes the soundtrack to our life. I mean, we are really truly starting at the source and everything else is built upon this core creation. So I'm Shahid, I head up the artist services business uh, uh, and uh, we have dedicated teams across you know, distribution and marketing. But as I said, I don't deal with any of the publishing matters day to day. And I'm really, really you know, wanting to jump at this opportunity to moderate this panel because Having previously been a young producer and composer 15 years ago myself, you know, that had to figure out the world of publishing, 
They had to figure out the world of PROs, inter-territories, distribution of royalties, yada, 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 just to get my share of performance royalties for me and my co-writers six years after the songs have been a success. I mean, this is such an important topic and I cannot stress this enough. So the whole episode was a blessing for me though, because I learned so much through this process, but we are here to make sure that you, all of you that's watching today, don't have to make the same mistakes and you know, develop at least the know-how, how to navigate the field. So. As we go along, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna have three panelists. I'm gonna introduce them very, very soon. Uh, but if you have any questions, uh, you know, we want to keep this super interactive. Do drop it in the Q and A box, and we'll try to get to it through the session. So to help pull the curtains back a little bit on this topic, we have three esteemed panelists with me as we dig a little deeper into the world of publishing. So today we have first and foremost Mary Megan Peer, CEO of Peer Music. Amy Thompson, Chief Catalog Officer at, Hip at Hypnosis, and David Shields, Head of APAC Music Publishing Partnerships at YouTube. Welcome, everybody. So um, I, I want to first kick off and say uh, thank you all for taking the time and being a part of this academy. I think we've, we're going to have a really great mix of perspectives from the publishing point of view, from the manager of catalogs, from even the platform. So I'm, I'm really in, uh, looking forward to, to, to speaking to all of you. But first and foremost, just a quick hey, hello, hi. How is everybody? Everybody safe and well? Hi, Saeed. Hi, Mary Megan. Hi, David. So it's, we've got Very David well, in, thanks, in, in, in Australia that's, seven, uh, that's at 7 p.m., We've got Amy Thompson, I think it's about, about 10 a.m. for you uh, and the same as well, Mary. So we're we completely international in this virtual environment. I think this is one of the you know, great blessings that we have you know, with the technology to be able to kind of converse. But the way I like to kind of kick off and we'll go into a bit of a one-on-one -on -one, uh, with, with each of the speakers and we'll start with you, Mary Megan. So Mary Megan, you are the Chief Executive Officer, a third generation peer to oversee the largest independent music publisher in the world. 38 offices, 31 countries, over 1 million copyrights in the works across all genres. I, I'd like to hear, just to kind of start off, let's talk a bit about your background. How, how did you get here? What, you know, how did this all begin for you and how did you come, in, come into this position? Sure, I joined the music industry about 13 years ago. Um, I started working for Pure Music. Prior to that, I worked in finance. Um, and I'm, since I came from a finance background, um, my original position uh, was working with our CFO um, on business development, particularly some larger acquisitions that we were working on at the time, and also some management reporting uh, that we were setting up. Uh, we have a, our own uh, proprietary uh, copyright and royalty system, um, and so kind of setting up the, the tracking part of that was important. Um, after that, I had the opportunity to run our office in Argentina. Latin America has always been a very important stronghold for pure music. Uh, we have seven offices on that continent, uh, which is similar to any of the majors. Um, so I moved down there for a few years, uh, running that office, really learning how publishing operates in a beam territory and also in South America. Um, and after that, I returned to New York um, and started working much more closely with our Asian offices. At that point, we had offices in uh, Singapore, Taiwan, and uh, Hong Kong. Um, and several years after that, we opened our first office in mainland China, signed our first writers there. Um, and then in 2018, uh, we purchased a independent K-pop publisher based in Seoul. Um, so that gave us a lot more exposure to that market. That has been a huge success. Obviously, we all know how K-pop is doing around the world. Um, and it's been wonderful to be able to provide our Western writers with opportunities to write in that market um, that they probably wouldn't have gotten if we hadn't had such a strong local presence. Um, and then just last year, uh, we acquired three companies in the neighboring rights space. Uh, so we got a little further afield from publishing. Um, and I moved to Europe uh, to work directly with a couple of those companies on the integration. That's that's a lot that you've covered in, in, in that space of time. Um, and quite a lot of what you do right now really focuses on un identifying the opportunities, uh, uh, you know, in, in emerging markets. And I see that you've actually focused quite a bit uh, in, in Latin America and, and Asia Pacific. Was that 
conscious? Was that an opportunity? How did you uh, uh, um, kind of read the market to see that there was there? Yeah, so as I said, uh, Latin America has been important for pure music for a long time, um, almost since our founding. My grandfather, soon after signing uh, his first copyrights in the U.S., uh, started working in Mexico and then in Cuba. Uh, and even in the 1930s, we had an office in Buenos Aires. Um, so, so we've always we've always had a lot of repertoire in the Latin field, um, and it's become a bit of a specialty for us. Asia was a, a little bit of a newer step. Uh, really, in the 1980s, we kind of established our first offices over there. Um, obviously, a lot of the collection societies were just getting started. Um, and so we built a presence much more slowly there, learning about the market, um, also kind of beginning to sign writers. And, 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 and when you sign writers, uh, can you walk me through what you know, how does peer music work with writers uh, uh, fundamentally and does it you know differ when you work with writers in Latin America versus Asia versus in Europe versus in the US? Sure I, I mean we certainly have different relationships with different writers but I wouldn't say it is so dependent on what territory you're in as opposed to what type of writer that you that you are. Uh, obviously, there's a fundamental difference uh, in terms of what a pure songwriter needs compared to someone who is also a performer uh, and is, is wants to compose only for themselves. Um, we work with both uh, of those those types of, of composers, um, and some composers really want to focus on specific genres, um, getting in synchronization, so they focus on getting into commercials or in video games. Um, other write, writers are, you know, very, very focused on just continuing to work uh, with the folks that they're, they're currently working with. Um, so there's all kind of different flavors of what our deals are, but I wouldn't say it's necessarily particularly territory specific. Mm -hmm. um, we provide a lot of services to our writers, but it really depends on what they see in their career uh, and what kind of assistance they need. Uh, synchronization is, is a huge area for us. Some writers like writing specifically for the sync market. Others would only like to have their songs that they've written as individual compositions, not for the synchronization market, to still be used in film or TV and advertisements. So we spend a lot of time on that. Um, but then we also get very involved uh, with others who are, say, writer producers, uh, we get very involved in the production, making sure that they have opportunities uh, in the studio with new folks. Some of our a &Rs are actually producers themselves um, and and uh, help get albums out. All right, that's wonderful. And 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 I think that the, uh, what you mentioned was there's, there's quite a bit of collaboration that's happening. There's a lot of matchmaking that's happening, um, you know, could you walk me through a little bit about how the ARs kind of navigate that? How do, how is it something that the the songwriters have to explicitly say, say, hey, we want to really work with the K-pop artists. We, we we think it's really interesting over there. Can you hook us up, or or is it kind of a a little bit more led by peer music? To say, hey, we see that there's opportunities that way. Um, you know, why not you know match make you with this guy or that guy or that girl? You know, uh, how does that work? I can certainly go both ways. I think most likely, though, the writer is going to indicate to us that they would be interested in writing for a specific market. Um, it, it can be a lot of work to learn a new type of music, to learn a new market. Um, I think of Korea or Japan, where there's kind of almost set, not formulas that are behind the songs, but you really need to be very au courant with the genre and what different writers are doing in that space. Um, so it takes some work. So it's important to us that the writers want to put in that work. Um, certainly uh, being a global company, but still relatively small, um, all of our a and around the world know each other, and we pride ourselves on being able to put writers in touch uh, with folks they wouldn't necessarily be able to. I mentioned Korea as an important example. Um, the fact that we have five or six uh, Swedish writers who've had number ones, repeated number ones on the Korean charts, have been over and visited our offices there, visited studios with, our, with the producers that we work with there. It's an important, important part of what we do. Right. And 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 most of the time, when 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 those collaborations happen and those uh, works start start you know being forged together, are they really with the intentions like, hey, I'm writing a a, a song for the local market, or is there kind of like that ambition straight away? Hey, this is going to be an international song. We're going to have it everywhere. 
um, what's the thought process like around you know those you know, local writers working with international artists as well? Well, anytime we set up a collaboration, we make sure that there is a market for that song, uh, whether it is local or more for a different market that can change. Um, but we think it's really important if we're setting up time for our writers, that it is a worthwhile activity and not just from our, an artistic sense, but that there is a market for what they're working on. So we may have, uh, we may know that a certain uh, performer is going to be putting out an album and perhaps put together a song camp just around that specific album. We actually did that in Miami recently um, with um, both some Latin uh, writers and some uh, urban writers uh, to write just for a specific Latin album. Uh, and that was great because it got a lot of influences uh, because there was kind of writers from very different genres together um, and we ended up, I think, placing four tracks on the album that they were writing for. That's nice. And 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 typically with, for those songwriting camps that you organize, it's strictly for writers within the PM music or are you inviting writers uh, outside of the, the, the family? Uh, we often partner with another publisher or a label um, to, in, to invite some other folks in. It depends a little bit on the size of the camp. Okay, okay. We, we have one question coming in from Romani Assez. Uh, do you have tips on how to find a publisher or even land a publishing deal? I think it's really getting out there in the industry and meeting people. Um, almost all of our new signings come from folks that we already know, our existing writers recommend other writers that they're working with um, as being kind of a good fit. Uh, most publishers don't take a lot of, uh, you know, inbound inquiries it's it's more about who you know in the industry um so i think it's as a lot of networking uh, certainly working on your craft um attending uh you know uh, schools or or programs about songwriting those are all areas that publishers look for new writers in and and, and part of the opportunities that that peer music brings and as publisher brings is to kind of like, you know, not just forge those collaborations, forge those those uh, core creations to come to to fruition, but uh, you, as you mentioned earlier, a lot of it goes towards sync, a lot of it goes towards, you know, just, uh, traditional placement within ads, film and so forth. But, um, you know, there are things that you are, creative users that you are looking and venturing into, aren't you? Like, uh, you know, you hear things about uh, more integration within games or otherwise, are there some things that you, you, you recommend or you're working on? Yeah, I mean, we're very active in, in any sort of synchronization. Um, I think one of our writers, he's been signed to us for basically his entire career, um, the artist singer Donovan, uh, we're currently working uh, with a company in Australia on a cartoon series, which is based off of a, uh, a play that he wrote and includes all of his music. Wow. Um, so that's a very new usage. It's aimed at, I think, kids six to 10 years old. Um, so it certainly would be, will be exposing uh, the new generation to that music. Uh, ABC, the Australian broadcast company is in as one of the producers um, and we're gonna be selling it in a couple other markets as well. But that's the type of, kind of new projects that a publisher can get your music involved in. Okay, uh, I'm gonna ask you one last question before we move on to Amy. Uh, but uh, what, what you mentioned earlier, we, uh, mo most of the times when those projects come uh, uh, around because you're initiating it and you're kind of project managing it, I, I, I gather it's a big undertaking uh, and you have to find the right partners to kind of come in. Uh, but it's different in, in the sense that it's not like an ad or, or for commission work, is that right? Uh, so it's not new works that are being created for that specific project, no. And sometimes there are, though. Right. Okay. And and so it's it's using existing catalog and finding creative ways to be able to kind of uh, position it and, and create new assets from that. Exactly. That's wonderful. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to come back to you in a while. Uh, I'm going to switch over to, to Amy Thompson. Um, Amy Thompson, how are you doing? I'm well, and you? I'm I'm all right. I'm all right. It's uh five Good. twenty in uh, in the evening, so you know it's uh nearly the end of the day. Um, I in in kind of uh, uh, researching ahead of uh, 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 this this uh, session, I read an article that had a quote from you from about a year ago, just about the time when you joined hypnosis, and I and I absolutely fell in love and connected with this. It's like you said, 
Songs are like stories, chapters in the life of the songwriter and have the impact to create new stories for listeners. And I couldn't agree more. It's absolutely true. So can you please introduce yourself? Who are you? What do you do? And how you got there? Um, so I'm Amy Thompson and I'm the Chief Catalogue Officer at Hypnosis. Um, I have, I think now 30 years experience, um, mainly on a management basis. Um, I come from management the same way Merck comes from a management background. Um, however, within um, the artists that I've managed in the past, it's always been very much about we create the records from scratch. So our, our, our music was created very much in a 360 model. So from the creation, putting the music together, running the rollouts, running um, you know, the, the, the registration and publishing uh, issues, the business, the taxation, all of that. Um, and uh, Mark asked me to come to hypnosis. It's actually um, my anniversary tomorrow, first year tomorrow. Happy anniversary. Um, yeah, yeah. he asked me to come to hypnosis about uh, just over a year ago, which was obviously a real curveball for me. But um I really, I really had seen, especially in the last five years of me running my own business, the value and relevance of, of catalog. And my clients were within probably the first generation that had been under license deals. So on the master side, you know, this streaming had come along after they signed their deals. And so we were really, I think, one of the first generations to have to care about, well, hold on when does that deal end? When do I get my songs back? You know, when, you know, you're not relying on being a physical product in Tower Records anymore. I am doing, but every single one of these songs is a business, every single one. And you mm. have partners on the master side and you have partners on the publishing side and catalogs quite often, which is quite frustrating for me, get um, really categorized as a singular item. They're not a singular item. It is an umbrella for, you know, hundreds, sometimes thousands of absolutely unique partnerships. Um, and every single one of those partnerships triggers everything from splits and shares to codes that belong to it that make it function healthily in the outside world to what dates dictate how to manage those songs from celebrating anniversaries on the marketing side to reversion dates, collection period dates uh, on the publishing side, on the master side. Um, and I got a sort of baptism of fire about three or four years before I started at Hypnosis, where I had one huge client whose publisher had failed to register uh, the songs with their PRO and over 62% of their, um, their, their, their publishing income from the PRO. And indeed, the PRO itself was missing. And I didn't understand. I was like, well, what on earth, how on earth does that happen? You know, like the, the PRO was not from the same country as the publisher, but still, I mean, I was a manager. I didn't really understand. I was like, what's a PRO? So I got, became quite obsessed with it. Um, we, we actually sued the publisher in question, won the catalog back 14 years early, and now really have control of it. We, we have a phenomenal publishing partner now. But every two years, we have an option to get out and we have an option with a very, very short retention period. And, you know, just testing out, you know, that's been the number one thing I think for me at Hypnosis is, you know, the, the publishing side of the business for me is, is, is I essentially manage, you know, Hypnosis is not a publisher outside the United States. In the United States, we own a publisher, Hypnosis Songs, formerly Big Deal Music. Mm -hmm. um, but nonetheless, you know, every catalogue that we purchase comes with its existing partners. Some are ready to be moved, some are not. Some are life of copyright with someone else. Some have 10 more years to go, whatever. You know, we have, I hope, a great relationship with almost every publisher in the world. So it's really about, you know, I'm basically looking after all of the acquisitional catalogues. But to me, they're like artists. So it's like, you know... We have Neil Young, we have Lindsay Buckingham, we have Dave Stewart, we have Christy Hind, we have Deborah Harry. So it's really about, okay, if, if they were an artist, what would you do? And so essentially you're doing exactly the same as a manager. You're making sure the people they're in deals with are delivering. You're making sure that the money that they're supposed to be getting, they're getting. And you're touring them around the internet using key pivotal moments 
to make sure those songs last as long as possible and sort of transcend generations as much as possible. And like I said in that quote, you know, creating new memories and new stories for new generations with new platforms like YouTube, obviously with David, with TikTok, with uh, Chinese social media, with Weverse in Korea. So, you know, my job is essentially to manage the catalogs as if they were human beings. That's that, that's really awesome. I've, whenever I talk to 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 young artists or songwriters uh, uh, in in a previous lifetime, I, I feel connected to you because I I was there, had the same struggles, um, at completely different scales, uh, mind you. Uh, obviously, you know uh, the Singapore music market is 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 unfortunately much smaller, but nonetheless the struggles are the same. And every conversation I have with artists is always like. Oh, uh, I just want to create a song when I put it out. Uh, uh, as long as I get a bit of money, you know, uh, that's all good. And and that's not really true. And and especially true if they're an artist and a songwriter. Yeah. There are two different income yeah. streams. Two different things to look at. You know, there's yeah. a lot to be looked uh, looked into. What what is I mean, it? I think that that would be the number one the number one aim for 2022 for us. Um, and also I've been working um alongside Bjorn from ABBA. Um, on his Sessions app that he's properly launching in October of this year and his work that he's been doing with um, with uh, um, educational committees at the United Nations, which is, you know, o owning a song doesn't have to be terrifying. And I think that the lack of education in how a song is administered in the outside world is it's not shrouded in mystery. It's just that if you work at a PRO or you work at a publisher or you work at a label you're like I don't get it why don't you understand is it well because you do it all day that's why they don't understand and we meet new managers every day through our publishing business and through colleagues of mine that are just like there's no books there's no like where do I go to learn this you know so I think education of the roles of everybody you know I had no idea what a PRO was I mean I knew who they were but I didn't understand and even recently we've had two humongous writers with humongous lawyers I might add uh resign from PROs and I'm like what are you doing and they're like oh no no it's fine it's like shopping more money it's like no 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 <laughs> that's not what this is but they don't know because they've never been told that's not their bad that's that's our bad I think as an industry to sort of you know we've created this complex system and if we want to have a complex system then we have to give the, you know, at the end of the day, our customer, our supply chain is the writer. And yeah. if we don't, if we don't turn around and say, I'm sorry, how would you like us to explain this instead of, well, it's called this and it's called that. And if you don't like it, you know, be quiet. Mm, no, you know, it, it's time now, I think, to loosen the terms and, and, and explain the flow of income more clearly because, Otherwise, what happens is mass frustration, mass misunderstandings, not based on fact. And, mm. you know, the co companies getting attacked for that can complain all they like. But until they start to explain it clearly, they really can't be complaining about misinformation. Absolutely. And, 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 and just about that, I think it's important for us, uh, for the benefit of the, the audience, let's, let's not assume that they know what PRO is. What is a PRO and what, what is their true function? It's a performing rights organization. Um, traditionally and historically, you would become a member of um, the one from your home country. So if you're British PRS, if you're French SASEM, if you're American, you do have choice. There are currently four, GMR, BMI, uh, ASCAP and CESAC. Uh, and essentially the role that I got really confused by is obviously they're going out and collecting performance income but in addition to that, the performance income, you think, well, you, you know, you get a statement from them and your money's on there for your performance income. But I never understood that they collected performance income and passing it through to the publisher. So if you get your PRO wrong, then essentially your publishing income is affected. But what was what was what was interesting to me is that, uh, you know, first of all, you have a choice in your in your PRO, but they are, you know, I'm certainly not here to attack PROs at all, but it is quite scary how most lawyers actually say, I'll oh, go to the website and sign up. And there's a contract there that's the only contract in the music business, really, that isn't put under any scrutiny and isn't checked by a lawyer. And you have no options to sort of negotiate. 
Um, and at the same time, you're assigning your copyright normally for life um, mm. to a society for no advance with the, the US being an exception to the society uh, for no advance and no real audit rights, which I find kind of terrifying. Um, so essentially, you know, your, your publisher's number one obligation to you is to register, you know, so you tell them who your PRO is, they have to register the shares of the PRO. So you often don't encounter them at all. And I think that's why, you know, you know, companies like, like Mary's company are, I mean, literally I've tried to find an, an error in Mary's registrations over the world. They're not there. Like PR are phenomenal at it, but you know, you 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 don't engage with them much because your publisher steps in and does that role. Um, but you can operate without a publisher and have a PRO collect your writer share and your publishing share. But then you've got to be ready to do all your licensing yourself, which is a lot for for anybody. Um, yeah. But I think that the role that they play and the international way that they're collecting money. Um, and the lack of international system that actually exists to sort of form a, a global umbrella over PROs and being able to have a more direct licensing relationship with the YouTubes, the Spotify's, you know, you have one relationship with them rather than your Brazilian stream dropping in Brazil and making its way home to your PRO. Um, you know, I, I, four, I four years later at that as well. Yeah. Well, maybe not four, but nearly there, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's one more place where there's black box, blah, blah, blah. I think that the, uh, the, 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 curtain, the curtain over uh, PROs has to be lifted in a non-aggressive way for extreme debate, greater understanding, more education. I'm still learning every day what my rights are at ASCAP. You know, can they, can they pull me into licenses that keep my songs there for another five years without telling me? It seems they can, you know, can, um, you know, PRS state to people that they own my copyright? Yes, they can. You know, that narrative around it, I think, needs to, uh, it's certainly our number one discussion of 2022. Absolutely. And, and, and the original premise of PROs really was around the idea of, you know, collective bargaining power, being able to kind of set, you know, a price that are favorable to, to, to songwriters, to be able to, to, to uh, you know, to, to go to, you know, some of the bigger players uh, and collective more efficiently. I think the original promise was always about efficiency and it's not. Uh, uh, and it hasn't been for a little while, and I think uh, you know a lot of what you're talking about right now is 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 spot on with because we 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 have now the ability, being that things are mostly digital, to be able to be as accurate uh, with the data with the metadata uh, that we have available. So I, I'm going to ask you one final question, and I'm going to jump to David. Uh, hey. But you know the the uh, you you've you've taken artists from the ground up all the way to the, them becoming massive international superstars. And obviously, you know, the bigger they are, the, the more complicated maybe the problems would be. But let's start again. Like, what could a young songwriter do today to set themselves up properly? Um, I mean, first of all, I think just, you know, the, 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 there are growing reading materials online. I think that when you choose your publisher, that is a very special relationship. We're not in the business of creating songs really at Hypnosis, only at our publisher in the USA. What Mary's talking about with sessions and being able to grow as a writer is very important. So I think, you know, having your publisher being as proactive as possible and choosing someone that really, you know, that really understands your vision is very important. But I think also having a publisher where, you know, move away from your A&R and into the royalty department having somebody that can sit with you and explain to you and draw for you on a board without making you feel stupid because you're absolutely not. They, they can't write a hit. So if you don't fully understand PRO law, a little bit like <laughs> me, I'm learning every day, then, you know, that's their job to show you, you know, and be wise with your PRO choice. You have choices, you know, just take a second to make those decisions. And I think if you're, if you're going to be big enough to have a lawyer and a manager again, Surround yourself with people that you can ask really dumbass questions to. I do it all the time. And you need to be able to ask this so you don't make mistakes. You shouldn't be ashamed of what you don't know. You, you know, people will look down on you. Oh, you don't you know that? I don't give a shit. Like, um, that's why I'm asking the question. And when you tell me the answer, I will probably then be able to remember it. Um, so I think, you know, 
surround yourself with people that are going to look you in the eye, respect your talent and explain the business to you. Um, because you should be able to, I think the largest killer of creativity ever that I've ever seen ever is the frustration and fear of, but what did I earn? I don't understand. What does that mean? Like, what is that code? I don't get it. Oh God, get it away from me. Oh, I'm going out. Like, yeah. Okay. Why is your pay slip so terrifying? You know? Yeah. So I think just surrounding yourselves with people that can hold your hand for the business side so that you can be as fully creative with the creatives at your publisher, at your, at your record label as possible. Thank you so much, Amy. So we're going to jump over to David for a second. And uh, David uh, is YouTube's head of music publishing partnerships in Asia Pacific. He's got over 20 years experience in the music publishing sector coming from a PRO, APRA MCOS, I might add. Uh, but he's joined Google, uh, Google in 2019, taking care of uh, the region. But David, welcome uh, to the panel, got to the session. As I've asked uh, both Mary Megan and Amy before, who are you? How did you get here? What do you do? Thanks, Shahid. Um, look, I think to answer that question, I'm going to have to give up my age. Um, but how I got into the, the industry was I answered a job ad that was in a printed newspaper. Um, that was a real thing a long time ago. Um, it was an entry level position. I was straight out of university. I'd never heard of APRA. Um, and, you know, it asked, the ad asked if you liked music and you liked research. And I'd just done an arts degree where I spent most of my free time going to gigs. So, you know, that I was able to answer both of those questions, honestly. Um, that took me into, you know, as I say, entry level position at a, the Australian Collecting Society or PRO. Um, I spent the next 20 odd years there. Um, working in 10 or 12 different jobs across, you know, various parts of the business. Uh, and then in uh, late 2018, uh, the opportunity to work with uh, YouTube came up in this role and um, I jumped at the chance and that's how I got to, to where I am today. Awesome. I, I was going to ask you as a follow-up question, what was your first big break? So it would either be answering that ad uh, or joining YouTube. <laughs> Yeah, um, it's a big question. Look, I think there's something in between there, which was moving up into the licensing realm um, and becoming, you know, th that that sort of led me into commercial negotiation and, and set me on that path towards towards YouTube. So it was probably then about, about you know, a quarter of the way through my career at the PRO. Yeah, and 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 I think you you you've landed it in a in a very interesting time. It was real, you know, that twenty years was where everything was kind of falling off a cliff, and in in the last ten years, uh, and I'm being a bit generous, the last you know five to ten years maybe is where things were on up and up, and you were the among the you know you're getting the first hand experience of digital online, and you were kind of in the center of that, was it not correct? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I started at Apple in 1997. So, you know, before um, file sharing, you know, decimated the music industry for a few years. Um, I then lived through the disaggregation of the publishing industry. So publishers pulling out of PROs around the world, directly licensing their rights. We see the rise of digital services and, and everyone working that out. Um, and now, you know, into what feels like a more stable environment um, and one that's really, you know, geared up for future success. So, so I, I, I want to kind of take something a bit more foundational and I, I wanted to kind of help you, uh, help me explain to the audience, what is the fundamental copyright framework that they need to kind of navigate around? Okay. Um, speaking of big questions. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> let's break it down a little bit into a, something perhaps a little bit more simple. So you start with a track, right? First up, just cut it in half. You've got the sound recording, the artist on one side. You've got the publishing, the composer on the other side. Okay, and now we're talking about publishing here. So we'll talk about the composition. Once you've got that, it's then split between mechanical or reproduction rights. So historically, the right to reproduce onto another format, either onto a CD, a tape, um, printed music, etc., uh, and then you've got the performing right, which is the public performance, the broadcast, the online communication. Now, those rights could entirely remain with the composer, 
they could be partly or fully assigned or licensed to a collecting society. Um, and, you know, also, I guess if the right is big enough, you know, you need to add a publisher into that mix as well. So once you've done that, you then need to sort of overlay those various the various copyright, rule, copyright laws around the world. Um, you know, which rights are triggered for different types of use can vary country by country. You know, for example, in the US, you've got a download that doesn't trigger a performing right, but then in other countries, that's not the same. When we talk more specifically about YouTube, again, at a really broad level, we need to clear performing and mechanical rights. Quite, quite simple when you think about it. Um, and the idea there is we want to make as much repertoire available as possible. And so we do that via this sort of patchwork of deals around the world. It's certainly not an easy task, um, but, you know, let's be honest, if it wasn't, uh, you know, if it was easy, I wouldn't have a job. So, you know, the complexity <laughs> is really great. Um, <laughs> And then, and then we add shorts into that, right? The new new shorts service, um, you know. So with that, we need to make sure that we've got all the necessary rights there as well. And that might mean in some territories, it, it's called a synchronization right or an extension of the mechanical or reproduction rights. So you know, there's there's all these sort of levels. But you know, taking it back to kind of that first um, the first part of the question, it's really just about going. I'm a composer and I have these certain rights that are available to me, right? And I need to think about how I'm going to, you know, make them available to the world and how I'm going to manage them, as Amy was saying, and, and as Mary Megan was saying as well. So, you know, I, I think, you know, to close that out, I'd say, you know, when you're considering that as a songwriter, it's really about the best way to manage your rights and still leave time for your creativity. So it could mean becoming a member of a collecting society, it could mean signing a publishing deal, it could mean utilising a digital aggregator or managing them, you know, yourself. There's not really a single correct answer. But the one thing I think is really important to say is that your songs have value. And that should be foremost in your mind whenever you make a decision about those rights. Again, to echo what Amy was saying, you know, don't be afraid of this stuff. It's, it's, it's your money. It, they're your rights. You know, make it worthwhile. And 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 you you touched on a little bit about how you know the songs are used on a platform, and you you mentioned shorts earlier. And I think shorts is one of the uh, uh, um, you know uh, uh, really an emblem of of how there's this explosion of user generated content. So many different uses of copyrighted content that is emerging within that you know social text space that never existed. You know even a couple of dozen, you know, a couple of years ago. So as, as regular people, you know, seek to express themselves, they're creating con their own content and overlaying that content. Is, is that, you know, how can songwriters embrace it or should they even? <laughs> Look, yeah, you're right. We, we live in a fast moving world. Um, you know, it does feel like opportunities, new opportunities are cropping up every day. Um, it, it's weird to call them traditional services now, but, you know, Spotify, the Apple Music, even YouTubes of the world do feel a bit like that. Um, you know, layer on top of that, then the explosion of short form video. Again, a shameless plug for YouTube shorts here. Virtual concert, concerts, the metaverse, Mary Megan mentioned gaming, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Suddenly realised, you know, there's almost limitless opportunities for songwriters. So to answer, I guess, the second part of your question first, Absolutely, songwriters should embrace that. It's tough to make a living. Anything that adds to the pie has to be a good thing. As to how, um, look, I'm not a songwriter or artist. I wish I was. I'm not going to pretend to speak for them. But look, my view as a music lover is that a good song is a good song. Right from the heart, the rest flows. But at the same time, be aware of what's happening in the world, right? Do you have back catalogue that works for short form video? Could you do a demo session on Roblox? Um, does the song that um, didn't make the cut for an album have another li another life in a music library, right? Thinking about different ways, you know, that your music can be used, can be heard. That's what it's all about. That's that's a, that's a great. Uh, and and actually, in 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 answering that, you you shared a few examples of you know where it's that combination of the artist songwriter. So do you actually see that this has kind of encouraged more and more songwriters to come out on their own and become artists of them by themselves? Uh, uh, or is, is, is it just because it's a bit more apparent? So where, where do you kind of lean on the argument? Uh, look, I think, it, 
I just think it varies market by market, honestly, and it depends on a range of factors. So, it, you know, culture, size of the market, copyright frameworks, business models, um, you know, take a mature music market like Korea as an example, right? You think about the larger K-pop bands, they're highly skilled singers, musicians, dancers, but that creates a huge opportunity for a dedicated songwriter ecosystem within it. Right. And so much so, right, that songwriters around the world, Mary Megan mentioned it earlier, will regularly contribute cuts for K-pop artists. You know, I mean, Ed Sheeran wrote um, a recent BTS hit. You know, incredible, right? Conversely, for maybe smaller, less mature markets, there might not be as much financial opportunity to exist purely as a composer. So, you know, we'll likely see more artists, songwriters here. I, I don't, th my sense is there's not a right or wrong, you know, do what, do what works for you. Some people can sit down and write a song, you know, without an instrument or with, you know, having very limited, you know, music playing capabilities. Others need to do it in a, you know, in a band setting with collaborators. It doesn't matter. You know, mm. some of the great, you know, great songs have come out of, you know, all sorts of different um, environments. Thanks, thanks, David. So at, at this stage, uh, we're gonna bring Mary and Amy back into the fold. Uh, we're gonna have kind of a bit more of a, a open open session, open questions that I had, uh, and it's a free for all. Um, um, let me may, let me start maybe with a, a question that comes from the audience as I scroll this. Um, this might be a silly question coming from Romani SS, as Amy mentioned. No silly questions. This is exactly why you're here. Uh, I've been hearing about the importance of having a publisher a lot today, but I find it really hard to navigate and find someone who could help me with, uh, help me as an artist with that. What is the benefit from having a publisher? Maybe as a publisher, Mary Megan, you want to take this one? Uh, sure. And she actually goes on to compare it to just joining a local PRO or collection society like APRI um, yeah. so I'm, I'm guessing based in Australia. Um, and the difference is that a uh, publisher is going to directly register your songs around the world. Um, Amy mentioned it. That's a big part of our job is dealing with all the local collection societies directly, um, registering around the world in many different territories, and then collecting that money and getting it back to the writer in the most efficient manner. If you are just register with a PRO and you do not have a publisher, um, all that activity can take place via the inner society network. Um, which I do not believe is as, as efficient as our publishing network. Um, we, we have a lot more eyes uh, for the number of songs <laughs> when it goes to each of our offices. Um, we pride ourselves on having local staff in over 35 countries who are looking at the registrations and then tracking to make sure that when the song is used, that there's income that comes in. The other thing I'd say is that most PROs, and it does vary by territory, but in the vast majority of countries, they don't rep represent your synchronization rights and they don't represent your mechanical rights. Um, so there will not, they will not be doing any proactive placements in advertising, film or television. Uh, they may not be collecting your mechanicals depending on what country you're in. Um, so that's a whole another set of rights, which can be very important. Thank you, Mary Megan. Any other addition from Amy or David on this on that point? I think it's very I think, thorough. Uh, I think a publisher is essential when the publisher is good. It's like you know, a label is essential when a label is good. Um, you know, I personally have a very good experience of Pia, for example, like a ridiculously good experience. I think probably the best experience. I personally have for the artists that I have on Pia, but that's because Pia is the best place for those artists. Um, I have had to do a year and a half of um, representing a humongous artist without a publisher, with only the PRO, because we were in litigation with the publisher that we were leaving. And what I found was I was panicking for the first six months, just being like, I have no idea what I'm doing here. And like getting hit by, we need you to be in Dancing with the Star, and not the, the artist, the song, you know, through to Fast and Furious movie, a massive Volvo commercial, like blah, 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 blah. And I was freaking out because I was like, my God, I must be doing a bad job here. Like there is no shot that I'm earning this artist more money doing syncing than the publisher was prior. Now, obviously this is for an established artist where the requests are coming in thick and fast. Uh, it turned out 
that actually I did 464% more than the publisher. And I feel that that was because the publisher that we were with wasn't really getting back to the like $300, $500, $700, you know what I mean? Like they weren't following up. Did it get cut in the TV show? Did it not? The big ones were coming in for sure. But there was this kind of plethora of new business we saw kind of sprout in that year, Mm -hmm. which I thought was very interesting. Now, at the same time, it was so time consuming. And my artist was also a platinum member of the PRO they were with. So this PRO is just like, oh, my God, you know, just don't. I think the best piece of advice you can have is when you sign to a publisher, keep the term short. Keep the reversion period, which is the period that they can represent your songs when you have left and gone somewhere else. Keep it short. Then if you're happy, you stay. And make sure also, you know, all these people sort of running around going, oh, my God, I have a 95.5. Make sure your publisher gets paid. Make sure they're incentivized to do their job well. And then, you know, give them a short period of time in the life of copyright, which is, you know, the, the, the period of your life and then 70 years after, give or take, depending on who asks on the record, but on an average, 70 years after your death. You know, you, you've, got, you've got time if you have a hit, but you weren't happy with certain things with your publisher to move the hit in three years and a year's, and, and a year's reversion. That's fine. Um, but I think to be safe, keep your publishing term short. Don't be afraid of the publisher, you know, getting paid. People can squeeze to these 95 fives and then complain that no one's out there sinking their stuff all day. Well, how how are they going to pay the wages for those people? But just if you keep your reversion period short, then I think that keeps people on their toes. Everyone's really working hard. And if you feel like it wasn't for you, which can also very much be they thought you were making X type of music, which is their forte. You turned out to make X type of music, which is not their forte. And so they didn't even have the relevant sync people or, you know, they just were like, oh my God, like we thought we were getting this and we are an expert at this and you're actually doing country music when you said it was K-pop. We don't have anyone in Nashville, for example. So, you know, it's just about you're basically dating and you don't get married before you've dated for a couple of years. I, I love how many, many different things with music always revolves around dating, uh, <laughs> especially marketing. You know, you're, you're dressing yourself out to get the, the, the introduction and then, you know, hopefully they get to the good stuff. Um, yeah. that's, thank, thank you both for that answer. I, I have a quick question for Mary Megan coming in. Uh, you mentioned that obviously, you know, Pia is in uh, Hong Kong, China, Singapore. Uh, uh, we have someone from Vietnam. Are you working in the Vietnam market? We are not actively working in that market. We do have a representative, so we're collecting monies there, um, but we do not uh, have any artists signed there, or writers signed. Okay. Um, and, and moving quickly to the next one, David Bonomi. Uh, what is the best book, article, documentary about the music industry? If any, would you recommend reading, please? And if Amy is not gonna plug her book, I will do it for her. Uh, you should definitely check out uh, a book that Amy wrote uh, and released last March. Uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, uh, what's the title of it and where can they find it, Amy? Can we just make sure everyone understands this is free? I've never charged a dollar for this book, just so we're all clear. Um, it's called Artist Marketing and Management for Beginners, and it does cover, but actually, now I've done a year at hypnosis, I was thinking at Christmas, I actually need to write the whole copyright piece again because I've learned so much. But for the <laughs> basics, it's fine, and it's at um myobschool.com and you can download it for free you just download it get it printed just stick it in a binder but the other one i would recommend is um i think it's called how to get ahead in the music business the the don passman book Uh, all about the little heavier like i i would i would recommend maybe reading mine because it's literally pictures drawings it's a cake divided in two like david said you know you put jam on one side jam on the other how many plates you have to spin being in the artist game, lots of marketing tips as well. Um, and then like the basics of your points, what's the reversion, what's the collection period, like just mine's basically the ABCs. Whereas Don Passman's is like, wow. I mean, at Christmas, I read the new edition every year, like an absolute fan girl. Um, but the Don, the Don Passman book is, is really solid too. Awesome. 
So, so I'm going to ask one last question before we close the session. It's gone by really, really quick. It's almost five to six. Uh, David, I want to jump to you first. Um, you know, if, if we bump into your 16-year-old self, what, what exactly would be the advice that you would give yourself at that point? God. Um, <laughs> when you're given an opportunity in the music industry, jump for it. That's that's great. With 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 two feet and without hesitation. Hundred <laughs> percent. Go for it. Don't and don't for a, and don't for a second consider you know working in a restaurant instead. That would be idiotic. <laughs> Mary Megan, may I ask the same question of you? Sixteen year old self, what would you do? What would you tell yourself? What advice would you give your younger self? I think echoing on what Amy said, there are no stupid questions. There's so much nuance in the business, particularly today. I mean, I was looking at the number of panels that you all have on NFTs and digital distribution. There's so many pieces to know about. And you're really, as a musician, you're running a small business. Um, and so always reach out with questions because there's so much to learn and it, it's changing all the time. Thank you, Mary Megan. And Amy? How about you? I think the same. Just it's so easy to have an ego and feel like you just look like an absolute idiot if you ask a question. And actually, the smartest people I know ask me questions. Like, you know, I there is a value in me being younger than some of my peers. Not that much younger, but a little bit younger than some of my peers. Because they like my point of view because I'm a woman or I'm younger or I'm British or I'm, you know, whatever. Um, you know, questions come, they're not, they're not all going upwards. There's the, the, the really smart people above you are also asking you questions because they're like, well, how would you do it? And that's also why Merck has a management background and I have a management background because I'm not coming at any of this from a publisher's point of view. I'm coming at it from, you know, can my artist read the benefits of what he or her did, period? And if they can't, why can't they? And sometimes those questions can be quite jarring, but... I wouldn't be able to do any of what we did if we didn't have the best legals, the best business managers. And I literally mean them up going, I'm so sorry. What does PRO stand for? Like, I don't know. So, be not, but your ego can stop you asking questions and that's, that will be your biggest downfall. Thank you again so much, Amy, Mary Megan and David. Uh, it's really lovely to have spent the hour with you talking over here and, and, and really learning from each and every one of you of, of your experience, uh, bringing it down for every one of us. Uh, I think there may or may not be a exclusive Q&A session that you might be able to meet some of the speakers on after this. So for those of you who are watching who hasn't kind of registered yet, please do so. Save your seat. Hopefully there is. I think maybe not. But, you know, again, try. Go in, go in with two feet. Uh, thank you again. I hope you have a lovely evening, lovely afternoon. Um, and I'll hand the floor back to Jasper. Thanks, Shahid. Oh, look at my hair. Um, so that was that was great. And um, what amazing, amazing session! I learned so much from that, including <laughs> what PRO stands for. Um, thank you, Shahid, for doing that. Um, as uh, I think that um, Amy Amy nailed the quote of the day, saying. Owning a song doesn't need to be terrifying. Wasn't that wonderful? Now you can, as, as Shahi said, we can meet some of the speakers. There's about six or seven of them going to be waiting for um, a select few at 6.15. You have to have registered for it. You're going to get, if you have registered for it, you're going to get information on where to go. It's going to be like a, bit like a, a posh Zoom call um, where everyone's going to be able to talk to the speakers and ask questions and stuff like that. So be great to see you there if you've registered. Um, to say it's full. If you have registered, please do turn up because you're taking someone else's seat if you if you're there. Um, but thank you again to everyone who participated in the Music Matters Academy Day One today. Publishing matters, as Mary Megan just said. I mean, who knew publishing was going to be so exciting for us to be able to program a whole day's worth of programming around publishing? So thank you to all of our speakers today for joining. Tomorrow, remember we have. Uh, we're talking about distribution. Um, you've written your song, you've got your publishing. Now, how are you going to get noticed? Um, and we're kicking off the morning at 10 o'clock Singapore time. Christoph Muller from YouTube, who's in LA, 
and Andrea Gleason from TuneCore, who's in New York. So we have a big, big session there. And then all through the day, some brilliant speakers from Ultra. We have Sophie Tucker, the artist. Uh, and then we have uh, Ulla Oberman, TikTok's global head of music. Paul Smith, Spotify's global head of licensing. And Dennis uh, Lagedlier believes wonderful, amazing CEO. So thank you again to everyone. Thank you to our sponsors, YouTube, Believe, uh, and and uh, Dolby for everything you've done today. Um, and uh, I'm going to wrap up and see everyone in the in the Q and A session. Thank you so much. At Believe, our mission is to develop recording artists and labels in the digital world. We believe that the best way to accomplish our mission is to provide them the solutions they need to grow their audience at each stage of their career. Streaming has changed how people discover music, paving the way for the rise of independent artists and labels. With digital, a new generations of millions of aspiring artists can now take their music to the world with TuneCore. In this decade, more artists than ever will find a path to make a living of their art freely and independently. Digital is changing the way artists are developed. Thousands of artists and labels are now using Belief's technology platform, innovative digital solutions, and relying on the expertise of our local teams in 50 countries. To our 1,500 believers, continue to learn and be inspired by the many artists whose careers you're contributing to elevate, and be proud of the labels you've helped develop in the past 15 years. To artists and labels, we thank you for trusting us with your creative life, with your digital business. Your independence, your power, and your freedom is our strength. We believe in you. To our digital partners, your unwavering engagement by your side propels us forward. To our new shareholders, your investment will support the development of our talent, our technology platform, and the acquisition of new capabilities. Together, let's shape a respectful, diverse, fair and transparent future for independent artists and labels. Thank you.